Good morning and welcome to Trolls Road Church. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning for what is going to be an excellent time of worship, of spending time with Jesus and time with one another. It's great to see the conversation going on uh, the Facebook feed and I'm just scrolling through check in here who's with us, and uh, it's wonderful. It's sort of like a virtual lobby as we say hi to one another. Won't it be great when we can actually see each other face-to-face and say hi to one another? I am so looking forward to that, but I am thankful for what we do each and every Sunday, and I'm thankful for the way that you as a church family continue to, to, to join with us and partner with us. We are getting through this together some other comments. This is great. And, and we will be continuing our, our streaming and, and some of these opportunities once we're back together uh, because this is a wonderful resource that we have. Uh, we are in a series on refreshing that the Easter season that we are in reminds us that the resurrection of Jesus means that we can live refreshed lives. And that's such an important thing, especially during discouraging times, those desert seasons when we're frustrated. So this morning, we want you to be thinking about what refreshes you. And I was thinking about the summer. I've got some grapes here with me this morning because we're going to be talking later about refreshing fruit. But I love in the summer fresh fruit. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite things uh, when I was younger was driving down to Florida, and when you crossed the border from Georgia into Florida at the welcome centers, they always had freshly squeezed orange juice for you. And I love Florida oranges when you're in Florida. Unfortunately, in the winter, we have to survive on fruit that's been flowing in from around the world most of the time. So I I want you to tell me, what's something refreshing that you enjoy eating in the summer? You know, think, think of a pool party or a backyard barbecue. What is it that you like? These grapes are pretty fresh. I actually, I was impressed how good these grapes are, considering they're not particularly, you know, from the vineyard next door kind of thing. What do you enjoy that's refreshing, especially in the summer on one of those hot summer days? One announcement, and I apologize, I'm realizing i got to chew this grape now. Carry on. Thank you. One announcement, just to highlight. Uh, We are praising God and thankful that we receive funding for some summer positions that we can hire some young adults at our church again this summer. Now, if you are interested in summer employment, I would encourage you to get one of the packages from the office. We can uh, email it to you or send it out. Um, But if you are interested in summer employment and you're under the age of 30, you don't have to necessarily be in school at the moment. Uh, The rules have changed from previous years. But if you're under the age of 30, and you are looking for summer employment, we've got a few different positions available. So please contact the office if you know someone that this might be a great opportunity for them. Uh, It might be a great opportunity for us. Then please make sure that uh, you connect the dots for us. Well, as you can see, we're not only talking about refreshing fruit this morning, we're also celebrating communion. And uh, I would encourage you to make sure you're prepared with some bread and and wine. Uh, And it's a chance for us to celebrate the refreshing nourishment of Jesus in our lives. I was uh, looking at the verse of the day on the U version of the Bible app, and it says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what we celebrate this morning. Let's worship together.
thankful that God is good. God is trustworthy. God is bigger than anything I complain about. He's present even in a pandemic. So let's be thankful today and bless his name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. Let's remember that we're connected not only through technology, but most importantly through the Holy Spirit. So let's offer this time of refreshing as our souls are restored.
Holy God, our Heavenly Father, you brought breath and life to all things, and you called it very good. And through your Son, you conquered the grave and shattered the power of sin. Through his resurrection, you have restored us and promised us eternal life to all who follow him. By your grace, we're called to abide in him and bear fruit, reflecting your love to the world. Lord, our world becomes increasingly divided and polarized, and yet you call us to unity, not uniformity. Even when we might disagree, you call us to unity and love, and in the power of your Spirit, you draw us together. I pray that you will make your church a living example of, of unity in Christ for our world to see. In your word in 1 John, you warn us of the consequences of not loving one another in unity. I pray that you'll help us with this. Our world it needs this today. Lord, I want to praise you for your answered prayers, and in particular, Lord, I, I, I praise you for your incredible provision for the refuge. I thank you for Clarence and his leadership there. Lord, they are a light shining hope and love to young people in our community who are struggling and desperately need to know you. Lord, we lift up Carriage Country Baptist Church and ask you to bless their work as they share your love with our community. And Lord, we hold up the work of the Pregnancy Help Center as they come alongside and, and minister to people who need your love in their lives. Lord, we think of those who are grieving, and I pray for Arthur as he grieves the loss of his brother. Will you be a God of comfort and peace for him? And Lord, now as we turn to hear from your word, I pray that your spirit will anoint Pastor John, that you will give us ears to hear the message that he brings to us, but hearts to, to understand and embrace what you're saying to us and help us to live that out as we go from here. Thank you, Jesus, for all you're doing and all that you're going to do. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Tyler, for leading us in prayer, and thanks, worship team, for some, some songs that allow us to reflect on the, the refreshing aspect of God. Um, at times, we can see the Christian faith as, as obligation or even drudgery, and, and Jesus wants us to understand that new life is exactly that. It's refreshing. It's breathing after being suffocated for years that the Holy Spirit came in and blew through that tomb and emptied it of, of the smell of, of death and decay and replaced it with the, the fresh scent of resurrection and new life. And our lives should smell like resurrection and new life as well. 
Grapes can be very refreshing. It's, it's a, actually an analogy, an example, a metaphor that's used throughout the scriptures. In the Old Testament, you see this idea of grapes or a wine press, a vineyard used time and time again, especially in the prophets. In the New Testament, you see fruit used to explain the Christian life. And specifically, Jesus talks about vineyards in many of his parables. But this morning, we are going to be looking at a metaphor that Jesus uses in John chapter 15. And Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Pastor Tyler, in his devotion on, Sun, uh, on Thursday morning, rather, he talked a little bit about this idea of God as gardener. If you remember that Mary, after the resurrection, saw the empty tomb and she was scared and confused and she sees someone and mistakes him for the gardener and it was actually Jesus That's not an accidental reference, because at the very beginning in Genesis 1, God introduces himself as a gardener. He plants a garden, the Garden of Eden, and he creates a man and a woman, and he asks them to do what? To care for the garden with him and on his behalf. And Jesus explains that that God is the gardener, and Jesus himself is the vine, If you're old enough to remember Keith Green, one of his songs has the great lyric in it. He is divine and we are the branch. So we are the branches. I know my girls are rolling their eyes. Dad joke. I couldn't resist. But we are branches. Jesus is the vine and God is the gardener. Now we don't have time to dig into this this morning. But in the Old Testament, the prophets refer to Israel as a vine. And some of the judgment specifically references their fruitlessness as a vine, the fruitless vine of Israel. So Jesus calling himself the vine is calling himself the new Israel, the new hope of God. And that's something that you can explore on your own, but it's a very powerful thread and theme throughout the scriptures. Now in verse 2, Jesus gets right to the point when he says that the gardener cuts off dead branches. And this is very sudden. But what is a dead branch? Well, it's a branch that doesn't bear fruit. And God cuts it off because it has no value. It has no worth to the kingdom of God, to the vineyard. But what if it's a good-looking branch? Or what if it's a really strong branch? Or what if it's a branch that really, really, really wants to bear fruit? It goes to sleep at night thinking, oh, I just wish I could bear fruit. It doesn't matter. If it doesn't bear fruit, it's a dead branch. And so God cuts it off. Now, in this particular passage, I have heard people unpack that section of this verse and talked about it in eschatological terms or discussing heaven and hell. We should point out that in this metaphor, it looks like God is doing this in an ongoing fashion, the way a gardener would cut off dead branches regularly off the vine. And yet Jesus, in some of his parables, like the wheat and the weeds, or, or in uh, some of the other parables, uh, the sheep and the goats, for instance, it seems that Jesus waits until he comes back to separate out the dead branches and the living branches. So I am convinced that this really is not useful for those discussions. Jesus is trying to make a point, and that is there are two options. There are dead branches, and there are branches that produce fruit. And we always look for third options. Those, those good branches that don't produce fruit. Those, those branches that are trying, you know, they're doing the best they can. There's two options, a dead branch and a fruit 
producing branch. Now, that's the one thing the gardener does. The other thing he does is he prunes all the rest of the branches. He doesn't just prune the small, puny branches or the weak branches. He prunes all of them. Now, why is this? Well, in Hebrews chapter 12, it specifically says that God disciplines those that he loves. He treats people who are his children like children, disciplining them to the place and point of maturity. And so this morning, we have to acknowledge that God should be actively pruning in our lives if we are his children. There should be relationships or attitudes or habits that God is actively trying to prune back for our sake so that we can produce more fruit. Because that is the goal. Not to have a better branch, but to have a branch that produces more fruit. A branch that is more mature. This is about potential. Now, occasionally, I come across someone who says, you know what, God's just not doing anything in my life right now. And that's a frightening statement because one of two things is true. Either it means that God's not pruning in your life, and therefore you're not actually one of his children, or, and this is more often the case, I find, that God is pruning in your life, but you are resisting or ignoring what he's doing. In James chapter 1, it says, Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when you face trials, when you face pruning of many kinds. Why? Because it produces maturity. Because it produces the kind of life that produces fruit. And so, this morning, our first challenge is to embrace the pruning of the gardener. What is God actively trying to prune in your life? If you don't know the answer, you might want to pray about that and say, God, reveal to me what you are trying to prune. You might want to sit down with a a piece of paper, your journal, and and put some thoughts to paper and reflect. And, And as you're reading scripture, be open to God speaking to you about the areas in your life he's trying to prune. Because we can resist his pruning and the impact will be minimal or... We can participate with it. We can embrace it. We can bring other people into our lives to be part of God's pruning through accountability, through honesty and encouragement. The goal of the gardener is not to have nice branches. It's not to have branches that behave well. It's to have branches that produce fruit. And God is actively trying to help people produce more fruit. He wants to have a beautiful and fruitful vineyard. We call it the kingdom of God. And you are a branch in God's vineyard. And this church is a collection of branches in God's vineyard. And so the question should be, are we producing fruit? Now in verse 3, there's something very peculiar that Jesus says here. He he talks about, uh, you are already clean. What's going on there? You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. This might be a good time to mention that the word for prune and the word for clean are actually the same concept. As a matter of fact, you could say you have already been pruned. You have already experienced God's pruning, whether you realized it or not. Jesus is helping the disciples understand they are in this process. He has watched his heavenly father, the gardener, prune his disciples, the branches, so they could be even more fruitful. And how did he do this? Well, I came up with a couple of examples. First of all, he literally disciplines and rebukes his disciples on several occasions. Remember the storm where Jesus has to stand up and say, hey, 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 quiet, to the storm, like any good parent. And uh, his disciples were so scared. And Jesus looks and said, why were you afraid? Why don't you have more faith? That was discipline. That was pruning. Remember when the children were trying to get to Jesus and the disciples were playing secret service and Jesus is like, guys, what are you doing? Let the children come to me. I want children to come to me because we need to have faith like children to come to Jesus. Again, rebuking. On the road, having a discussion, Jesus says, hey, fellas, what are you talking about? And everyone goes quiet because they were arguing about who was going to be the greatest in heaven. And Jesus says, don't, don't do that. You don't understand, in heaven, it's not like here. In heaven, the first will be last, and the last will be first. These are some of the several rebukes, and they weren't to embarrass or to impose guilt on his disciples. They were to help in the pruning of his 
disciples. But there's also all of the examples of his training and teaching where he not only would let them hear his teaching, but remember, he would pull the disciples aside and explain some of his teaching, some of his parables. That's part of the pruning process as he helps them apply it to their lives. And of course, he modeled it for them as he would steal away in the morning to spend time with his father. He would pray and invite his disciples to join in prayer so they would see how much he loved the father and how much he knew the father loved him him. These are just some of the examples of how the disciples already experienced it. How have you experienced God's pruning in your life? Because you have, if you're a follower of Jesus, some some of those hard times, especially. He prunes in good times, but in those difficult seasons, I bet God's pruning is all over those difficult seasons. Did you recognize that out of love, he was actively involved in those difficult circumstances? Then we get to verse 4, and and Jesus basically gives us the not-so-secret of the Christian life when Jesus says, remain in me, and I will remain in you, and you will produce much fruit. In Colossians 1, verse 27, the Apostle Paul puts it this way, this is the mystery being revealed to the world, not just the Jews, but also the Gentiles, the hope of glory, Christ in you. Not Christ with you, not Christ near you, Christ in you. This combination of Christ in us and us in Christ is a very dynamic and confident relationship. Uh, I, I, was, uh, I was listening to the radio with my girls in the car, some top 40 radio. I'm going to get crushed for this, but I'll use the example anyway. Uh, Justin Bieber and Chance the Rapper have a song called Holy. Uh, In the song, these lyrics just jumped out of the speakers at me as I was preparing for this Sunday. I know I ain't leaving you like I know you ain't leaving us. I know we believe in God, and I know God believes in us. Now, grammar aside, that's, that's pretty powerful theology. I mean, I grew up and I suspect in our church as well, we do emphasize the need to believe in God and we need, to, we need to absolutely actively pursue God. But let's never forget that God first pursued us, that God believes in us. He's not up there saying, I knew they would blow it. Oh, I knew he was a wreck. I knew she would let me down. That's not what the Bible shows. The Bible shows that Jesus came to us to be with us and eventually to be in us because he believes in us. And the one thing we know is he ain't going anywhere. This is not a 50-50 proposition. I'll come partway, you come partway. It's kind of a spiritual compromise. That's not what's going on. Jesus came 100% of the way from heaven to earth so that he could live among us, he could die for us, and he could rise again. That's 100% of the effort, 100% of the necessary, uh, uh, the necessary spiritual application that needs to take place. What's our response? As much as we can. Mustard seed percentage faith will do the trick. It will start us on the journey. 1% with his 100% is a pretty powerful thing. But if we can do 2% instead of 1%, or if we're at 10% and we prayerfully through the power of the Holy Spirit engage 20%. Do you see where I'm going here? What will never change is the 100% on God's side of the ledger. The 100% of effort that Jesus gave and continues to give for this relationship that we're talking about. So the question is this morning, what's our percentage? How much are we trying to be in Christ? You know, being in Christ has so much benefit. You can email me if you want the scripture references for these things, but um, we are included in Christ. We are made alive in Christ. We are united in Christ. We are justified in Christ. We are made children of God in Christ. We are given every spiritual blessing in Christ. We have eternal life in Christ and are promised the peace of God that passes all understanding that will protect our heart and our mind in Christ. That's just a small sample size of what happens when we reciprocate Christ in us and we pursue a relationship where we are in Christ. This is only possible by remaining in the vine. It's not possible by trying hard. It's not possible by being a good person. It's only possible by being 
in Christ. Otherwise, we're dead branches. What are you doing to be in Christ? To put yourself in that position to experience the fullness that he has for you in Christ. This morning is a great start, by the way. Joining us on a Sunday morning or joining another church family Sunday morning after Sunday morning is a great place to start. But of course, we all understand that's not enough, even though at times, certain seasons of our life, that might be the, the fullness of our trying to be in Christ. But, but what does it look like when our Bible is sitting on the bookshelf or on the coffee table? Is there dust on it or is it open and are the pages worn and underlined? And do we drink it in as that refreshing drink that Pastor Tyler talked about last week when my mom passed away? I'm not an overly sentimental guy, but the one thing I wanted was her Bible because it was so wonderfully worn. It, the, the book, the, the physical book itself was a testimony that my mom was in Christ and Christ was in my mom. What are you doing? How do you pray? How do you worship? How do you serve? These are the places where we meet with Christ and we are in Christ. We need to pursue these opportunities, create these opportunities if necessary, and discover the fullness that God has for us. And the result is, verse 5 sort of reiterates this concept, we will not just produce fruit, we will produce much fruit. Now, in Galatians 5, there's the fruit of the Spirit, and that definitely reflects some of this fruit that we're talking about. But I want to look specifically at what Jesus says later in the passage. Because in verse 8, he says, this is for my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. One of the fruits of being in Christ and Christ in us is we look like a follower of Jesus. Unfortunately, especially in the media, sometimes you get people who put their hand up and identify as a follower of Jesus. And everybody in the church and outside the church is saying, I I don't think that that quite seems right to me. And we always look at celebrities and are disappointed when their lives don't reflect Christ in them and them in Christ. But do we hold ourselves to that same accountability? Do our lives reflect that we actually are trying to live following the teaching and the example of Jesus? In Matthew chapter 7, there's a couple, couple of very startling passages in the Sermon on the Mount. And one of them says, it's simple. Good tree, good fruit. Bad tree, bad fruit. Can't tell you how many times I have heard people say, I'm a good person, I did a bad thing. Now look, good people do bad things. I'm not trying to argue if you did something bad that that means you're this horrible person. But your life will reflect the things that are important in your world. And if Jesus is important, if the vine is important, that will come out in your life. It doesn't mean you won't make mistakes or do something bad. It'll certainly affect the way you respond to that. Instead of denying or lying about it or trying to pretend like it's not a big deal because someone else did something worse, there's apologies expressed. There's, there's sadness over 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 the way that things have played out and the people that have been hurt and there's confession to God. Your life looks very specifically like Jesus if you are in the vine. But it's not just showing ourselves to be his disciples. It also says in verse 11, let me just find it here, I have told you this, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made complete. Listen, if you are in the vine and the vine is in you, you have joy. And not just any joy. It talks about this complete, this mature joy. And what is in you, by the way, tends to be what comes out of you. Jesus said that elsewhere. When you get squeezed, when your circumstances are crushing you, something's going to come out. When you hit your, your thumb with a hammer, something comes out. It's not always joy. But it could be. The Apostle Paul was in prison. And not prison like we have today, which isn't great. Needs serious reform. But prison where you had to figure out who could bring you food. They didn't provide food for you. you he was chained to a guard. No privacy. No, no opportunity to watch cable TV or, or you know, watch Trolls Road Church on Sunday mornings. This was not good. And Paul says in Philippians, in those circumstances, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Why? He was squeezed and what came out was what was in him. 
That was the joy of the Lord. I'm not telling you to pretend or to be naive or, or to put on a phony, joyful front. But you know, you can be discouraged and have joy. You can be frustrated and have joy. What a gift to our world and our community and our family that in these frustrating circumstances that we're in today, if we express joy instead of nastiness or, or argumentativeness or frustration, what if, what if we take our frustration and we replace it with the joy of the Lord in our conversations, in our Facebook posts, in the way we treat one another? And in verse 12... He tells us that my command is this, that you love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. Sacrificial love is the fruit of being in the vine. Our love should be unlimited the way that God's love is, and that is a high call. As a matter of fact, it's an impossible call if it's our love. But if it's God's love in us, if it's Christ in us and that love for us being expressed to other people now, it's possible. As a matter of fact, uh, it, it, throughout the scriptures, it, it talks about this idea of sacrificial love. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount says, hey, you know what? People are, are willing to treat their friends nice. And people are willing to sacrifice for their friends. But I say, love your enemies. Impossible. If you're not in the vine just doesn't work. Your effort, your desire to be that person, you will not be able to reach that kind of love without the love of God in you, Christ in you, and you in Christ. A branch connected to a healthy vine can't help but produce fruit. We're not talking this morning about how you can produce fruit. We're talking about how you can be in the vine because Christ is in you, and fruit happens. It just happens. I'm sure you're familiar with the story of the prodigal son. If, if you're not, just a brief recap. This snotty-nosed kid says to his dad, I want my inheritance early. He goes off, embarrasses the family, brings great shame on himself. He blows his money on his so-called friends, and then when he's broke, everyone leaves him, and he's sitting in a pigsty, and he decides, you know what my mistake was? It was that I didn't stay. I didn't remain with my father. I took off. And so he comes back and he said, I'd rather be a servant who is remaining with my father than be a son that's off here in a pigsty. And there's a beautiful truth in that. You know, better to be a servant in the house of the Lord, David says, than to spend your life elsewhere. And he comes back and his father says, no, 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 no. That's not the way this works. You're my son. You were my son in the pigsty, but now you're my son here. And remain here in my house. Remain with me. And I'll remain with you. And we usually end the story there, don't we? I mean, isn't that where we end the prodigal son? But there was another brother, the older brother. And he hears this party going on. He comes in, and he's angry. And he says to his dad, what's the deal? I never left. I was here the whole time. And his father said, you don't get it. He he, he left and he came back. He, he's here now. He's with us. And the son said, I'm not, I have no joy about this. You know what this parable reveals? It reveals that you can be in proximity to Jesus and not be remaining in him. Do you hear what I'm saying? You can be around Jesus. You can be near Jesus, but that doesn't mean you're in Christ. You could go to church, you could know about Jesus, you could talk about the Bible and know the information in this book, but you could be the older brother or the older sister, and the way you can check is, am I producing fruit? Because the older brother was doing what he was told out of obligation, not out of joy. He was serving his father in in a way that didn't reflect sacrificial love, that reflected duty and honor but not a beautiful relationship with joy and love at the center of it. This morning, the question that you need to answer is, where am I? Am I in Christ or am I somewhere else? And the way that you can answer that question is is simply saying, am I producing fruit? Because we know the problem is not going to be, I'm in Christ and Christ is nowhere to be found. No, no, 
Christ will be in you. If you're a follower of Jesus, Christ is in you. The question is, are you in Christ? And if you're not producing fruit, therein lies the problem. It's not your behavior. It's not that you're not acting in a way that's producing fruit. It's that you're not acting in a way that's bringing you into Christ, that's bringing you into fellowship, into relationship, into intimacy with Christ. And so if you have something else in you, other than Christ, or you are attempting to be in something else other than Christ, if you are seeking that kind of intimacy, that kind of confidence, that kind of uh, uh, support in anything other than Christ, first and foremost, then you are going to struggle your entire life to produce fruit, and you do run the risk of actually being a dead branch. And this morning is your opportunity to change all of that To, like the prodigal son, come back to be with the Father, to be in Christ, to to celebrate that relationship. But it's also your opportunity that if you are the older brother or sister and you've kind of been going through the motions and you've been coasting, you're saying, you know what, I've been around, I've been in proximity, but now it's time to get serious. It's time to invest in this relationship and pour my life into Christ the way that he poured his life out for me. And that's what brings us to communion this morning. Communion is a celebration of Christ in us. Now, throughout history and in some denominations and, and, and different uh, frames and, and, and uh, groups of churches, they talk about communion as the literal, physical presence uh, of Christ. The, the, it's actually the body and, and the blood of Jesus somehow mysteriously and, and magically transforms. Uh, we, don't, we don't believe that. Um, and that's not our theology. But there are some churches that go the other extreme and say, you know what, this is just symbolic. This is just, uh, you know, just to jog our memory and, and celebrate what Jesus did. You know, we don't believe that either. We actually believe at our church and in our denomination and, and, and our family that this is not just a celebration and a symbolic activity, but this is the real, not physical, but the real spiritual presence of Jesus that we are symbolically taking in Jesus, but also the real presence of Jesus is something we can celebrate, that he is in us, and that we are committing to being in him. That's this communion discussion. And so as we eat and we drink this morning, we are celebrating and actively taking part in Christ in us and committing to being in Christ. So come to the Lord's table saints who love him. Come to the Lord's table and confess your sin. Come to the Lord's table, friends, and be at peace. In order for us to come to the Lord's table, we don't have to do anything. We have to accept joyfully the reality that Christ has done everything. And so it's important for us to take some time to confess the things that are preventing us from being in Christ the way that he wants us to, the way that we want to, the sin, the, the baggage, the, the stuff that collects and interferes. And so I'm going to lead us through a time of confession, and I would encourage you to respond to these statements by reading the phrase in yellow at the bottom of the page. Through our action and inaction, we have not remained in you, Jesus. Forgive us, Lord. We are sick in our sinfulness, hurt by the sin sickness of others, and unable to make ourselves whole. Heal us, Lord. We have placed our faith in ourselves rather than trusting in your power and goodness. Lord, Help our unbelief. We have forgotten your call to the poor, the sick, the needy, and the lonely. Send us, Lord. Why don't you take a moment and talk to God? Maybe there's some sin in your life and you want to confess that. Or maybe there's just been some apathy where there once used to be love and passion. Confess that and discover, like the prodigal son, that God's not really wanting to go through the long list of things that you've done wrong. He's wanting to embrace you and bring you back into fellowship with him. Let's let's silently confess any sin or any hurt or any challenges that we're facing this morning.
thank you, Father, for your gift of forgiveness that can only be found in Jesus Christ, his work on the cross, his resurrection, that not only forgives our sins, but the Bible says it removes it as far as the east is from the west. We celebrate that this morning. We give you thanks. We recognize that although it doesn't cost us anything to receive this forgiveness, it costs you everything. And so we say thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a great verse. I'd like, I'd like us to read this together. In Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Isn't that refreshing? Isn't that wonderful? You know, the Bible talks about peace as a result of forgiveness. Peace with one another and peace with God. And, and so we're going to, to do something called passing the peace. And there's sign language for this. We've done this several times. And I, I like this idea. I think it's a wonderful practice. But it's may the peace of Christ be with you. And if you're with someone this morning, if you're sitting in the same room, why don't you just make eye contact and do that. May the peace of Christ be with you. Again, very refreshing to celebrate peace together. Relationships that were once broken, back restored. There is something refreshing about that. And it starts with our relationship with God and then with one another and then the world around us. What a celebration that is. At communion, we use these symbols of bread and wine because Jesus gave us very common symbols that were rich with meaning and symbolism. Bread throughout the Bible is significant. The manna, as the Israelites were provided for in the wilderness, it acts as nourishment. It sustained them through the desert, and it spiritually nourishes us and sustains us And it is our daily bread, the reminder that Jesus is our daily provision. And the wine, wine, grapes, these are used, again, throughout the entire scripture, often as a sign of blessing, often as a sign of celebration and God's abundance. And this morning, Jesus invites us to drink this wine so that we can celebrate with him our forgiveness and our refreshing and restored relationship with God and with one another. Now, the Bible is quite clear that we're not to do this. We're not to eat and drink unworthily, according to the Apostle Paul. But again, it's not that our behavior makes us worthy. It's that we are here this morning, invited by Jesus, completely trusting that he makes us worthy. I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me, and then we are going to eat and drink in celebration together. Jesus Pour out your spirit on us. Help us through this bread and cup to taste and share the life-changing love of God. Amen. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says that Jesus gave this to him and he passes it on to us. It says, the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, friends, this is my body broken for you, all of you. Eat. And in the same manner, after dinner, as was the custom at the Passover feast, it was a toast. They would take wine and, and they, would, they would drink as a blessing to God. Well, friends, God invites us to drink and join and enter into that blessing. He said to his disciples, his friends, this is my blood. This is the new covenant that was shed for you. All of you drink. And we are instructed to, every time we eat bread, every time we drink wine, we're supposed to remember and enter in to that beautiful spiritual reality of Christ in us and us in Christ As we conclude our time of communion and as we get ready to sing one final song, I'm going to invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer with me. We'll put it up on the screen. And let's pray this together. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen.
Thanks for spending some time with us this morning. I hope you've been encouraged. I hope you've been challenged. You know, sometimes we have great intentions and we can try really hard or work really hard or we feel guilty. But what Jesus wants is for us to trust that he is in us. And if we truly pursue making our goal in life to to be in him, to make our life about him and, and to let things flow from that, we will produce abundant fruit. In the book of Romans, we read some familiar verses. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God bless you. Go in peace and enjoy a refreshing week with Jesus.